Okay, I think we are on right now. So I want to welcome everybody as I do every week and uh, and thank everybody to that is uh, everybody who is logging in here from all over the country and the world. I'm Gustavo Tolosa. I'm the host for the Dr. McDougall webinars on Thursday. And as usual, um, we're very excited to continue with our series of digestive tune-up, chapter 12 and previous, if you all have questions. And we are uh, we can never say thank you enough to Dr. McDougall. Dr. McDougall is a doctor, uh, not an alternative doctor, but a physician that treats patients regularly and has been practicing medicine for about 50 years. So he has a lot of experience. I call him the walking encyclopedia of medicine. So with that, Dr. McDougall, how are you doing today in California? Just fine. I, I always remember my dad's statement if I only remembered half of what I've forgotten. <laughs> That's very wise. So, uh, yeah, fortunately, I've had a passion for, uh, well, at first, my passion was not for medicine. In fact, I, if you recall the story I've told many times, I really didn't like being a doctor during medical school. Right. And not until I got into my residency after my uh, time as a plantation doctor. That's when I really got the passion for nutrition and anything at all. I mean, I didn't really see myself in medicine at all until after my plantation day experiences back between 1973 and 1976. And then my eyes got opened and I, I just could hardly wait to read everything. I, I still take <clears throat> uh, many paper journals. I try and get them all online these days, but I read uh, probably six journals at least every month regularly. Right. And uh, you know, it, it just sticks. Things that you like just stick with you. But then uh, the problem is, is that 50 years of material, you can't retain it all, at least instantaneously. But the nice thing is, is I had the foresight or fortune to write things down uh, in books and newsletters and also to do videos that are free on YouTube or right. in other parts of the Internet. So um, <clears throat> in a way, I feel bad that I don't remember everything I should. But in, in another way, I feel fortunate that uh, uh, that good fortune had uh, allowed me to write everything down that I thought to be true with the references and also to put it on uh, videos where people can just watch, uh, like we started the new Quick Start program on the website. Well, entirely free, you know, anybody who looks at it from a business point of view or uh, some alternative motive will say, I don't know why they did this. Why did they... Why did uh, John McDougall give his basic lecture on food poisoning, which explains everything so simply you can't deny it, free? And why did Mary put her meal planning video, which is something people should watch 5, 10, 20 times? There's so much information in there on how to prepare the food tastefully and simply. I mean, in just minutes. And uh, that's planning meals under the Quick Start program. And then the one that I really hate uh, hate we have to give, the one I really wish we didn't have to give because it presents so many challenges, and that's uh, the Mary, the lecture Mary gives on eating out. Oh. But at least it gives you some some help there. So, <clears throat> you know, we, we wrote it down. We put it on professional, uh, high-definition uh, film so that people can watch it. And we made it free. And uh, so as far as being an encyclopedia, or fortunately, it's written down and put on video because it's not all up here anymore. Well, you remember, it's amazing how you remember years and page numbers from your newsletters from just, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. But yes, Dr. McCall, I, I, we, we, there, we cannot emphasize enough how important that website is. is it's your, it's your legacy, and it's uh, people sometimes forget that it's there and that everything is there. So please go to that website. And well, thank you. Yeah, the, web, the website is well worth your trouble, and I, Mary and I plan to continue to support it with every effort in terms of money and in terms of knowledge that we can uh, go to the website. But, you know, the passion that I tell you about and my ability to remember things uh, that I tell you about in terms of medicine of all kinds, 
bypass surgery, angioplasty, uh, various drugs, etc. It's it's because of my passion. You know, I just love these bits of knowledge. I, you know, they get me so excited. And whatever you do, you know, if you collect stamps or uh, you're a painter or you can remember every painting you did, probably every day you put into that painting because your concentration is so much there. My concentration happens to be on medicine because I'm a doctor. But again, it didn't come easy. I didn't really like being a doctor until I learned about the food component. Then I loved everything about being a doctor. I learned about the brain damage from bypass surgery. I learned about... Uh, the side effects and the uselessness of diabetic drugs. You know, I, I, I and I can remember these things. <clears throat> now I have to admit it's sometimes harder, I know not these days, for me to uh, uh, to pick up new things and uh, remember them than it used to be. It used to be a little easier. But uh, with a little extra effort, maybe I have to do it twice now instead of once. I am able to get this knowledge uh, contained and in a fashion where I can uh, spread it to you uh, in a fairly accurate way. But anyway, that's that's thanks thanks for the encyclopedia compliment. But you <laughs> you all have the same, just like you and playing the piano. Yes. I, have, I have no doubt that there are pieces uh, that you know that you love that you can uh, you know you could probably I'm sure you could write out every note right now or yes. or, or hum the tune or whatever it is because. You just love that, and and you know that's my natural tendency. It's not that I was when it is a passion, that. like you're saying. When it yeah. is your passion and not and not just a job, then it makes all the difference. Yeah, you can hardly wait to see the next rose, right? Or you know, it's just a, it's just a, what you're naturally attracted to, and it just sticks. Uh, it, uh, you know, not it's not some it's a kind of special memory. It's just uh, a focus of attention, I would say. It's part of you every day, yes. Well, anyway, Gustavo, well, we have... Let's uh, go from philosophy now to medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what's, what's happened special this week. You know, the healthcare system must be really upsetting everybody. Yes. But I'm not going to weigh in on that. I, I, I gave a discussion about uh, the McDougal program under Trump rule. It's in uh, one of the newsletters maybe three months ago. And, uh, you know, it's got a ways to develop to the, my greatest fears. But uh, I think everybody looking at what's going on with uh, the Affordable Care Act and with the effort to uh, uh, disinvolve uh, people, uh, to disable them in terms of the health care system, it's got to accept for the most hardened uh, greedy person. It, it's got to be just terribly upsetting to see uh, little children, poor or of some means, uh, little children of any kind to suffer, or grandma and grandpa to be uh, basically uncared for out in the street because, you know, they're, they're not among the 1%. Uh, it, I, I cannot imagine more than 1% of the people being that greedy and uh, that selfish and that narrow-minded because it can't be done. So my bid still, as I see coming, I think I see coming, is for people to turn towards uh, uh, universal care, especially here in California, is people are starting to talk more and more serious about it. And it's not just uh, because it's right it's because it'll be more effective. And to me, you just get one person strong, head of universal care, who understands why people are sick, which is the food, and uh, be willing to take action and to say, look, we are going to teach children in school, dietitians in school, doctors in school. We're going to advertise on uh, football games and basketball games, and we're going to send out material to people to tell them the truth about why they're sick. They should at least know why they're sick. They shouldn't live in the era that I lived in 50 years ago, where we thought cigarette smoking might be healthy because it exercised the lungs. 
And it certainly was sexy looking for somebody sucking on this tube of tobacco. You know, that's where I used to be 50 years ago. Well, that's where you and uh, not necessarily you, but most of the people you know are right now. They they sit down to a block of cheese and say, that's the healthiest thing I could eat. Or I know that carbohydrates will kill me. And with this kind of ignorance, they don't stand a chance. Uh, their spouses are sick and die and they can't provide the support that's necessary for the family. And the children are fat and constipated and sick and being set up to die with childhood diseases or uh, for when they get older. You know, sick children, fat children develop into fat sick adults. It's because of what they've learned. So uh, again, that's probably what I what I listen to on uh, the news that um, most interests me and, and even surprises me is, is how much people are talking about universal care again. This used to be a very, very popular topic back in the early 90s. And that's when I had uh, a syndicated radio show that went all over the West Coast. I get, used to get 2,000 phone calls a night. Uh, you know, everybody was talking about universal care. And that's the pendulum, just like with diet. It used to be high carbohydrate, Pritikin, Burkitt, Kempner, uh, you know, James Anderson from the University of Kentucky and, and diabetes. It used to be high carbohydrate diet back in the 80s and 90s. And then the pendulum switched to low carb, high protein. Well, you know, trends change. And I, I think uh, the concern for the health care of people in the United States is uh, maturing uh, to where we're about to reach other developed countries. Uh, as I understand, almost all, all other developed countries provide some kind of universal health care for their systems. Uh, you could find the exceptions for me, but they are exceptions. And the United States is one big exception. The wealthiest, or it used to be the wealthiest country, and maybe China is now, the wealthiest country in the world fails to take care of its citizens and lets them be sick and suffer and causes all kinds of problems down the line. So um, anyway, we are going to talk about bacteria, I guess. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit, bowel bacteria. And uh, that's in Chapter 11 of the Digestive Tune-Up book. And what I'll be talking about is... It's actually 12, Dr. McDougall, just no, in case you, people Dr. are watching. Yeah, okay, thank you. Not that you don't 12. know. I told you, I told you the mind, <laughs> the mind <laughs> slips more often. It's Chapter 12, and it's about uh, a healthy bacteria. Uh, the bowel, the bowel, the large intestine we're talking about right now. Well, let's start with the mouth. The mouth is the dirtiest part of the body. Uh, as a medical student in microbiology, I was uh, I was uh, asked to take a, a swab of my mouth, put it in a, a petri dish, and look at the results three four days later. And the just a tremendous amount of uh, different cultures of bacteria growing on this petri dish. And my instructor said, see, the mouth is the dirtiest part of the body. Well, you could think about that as bad because that's the way we're taught is germs are bad. But germs are crucial for life. You know, some of them are bad. Some of them uh, do a lot of harm. But they are few in number. Most actually are, <clears throat> are helpful. They work with us. So we got all these bacteria in our mouth and then we swallow and the bacteria go into the stomach and most die because of the acid. Some don't, helicobacteria pylori, uh, other bacteria don't. And then uh, there's uh, colonies of bacteria that grow in the small intestine. B12 producing, by the way, just like mouth bacteria are B12 producing. <clears throat> and uh, the small intestine though is relatively clean it's got, but it does have bacteria in it. Then you get to the large intestine, you have this organ. And you really should think about it that way, as an organ, just like the liver or the kidneys. This is a, uh, a tube that's about uh, six to eight feet long. It's got a diameter, uh, well, fully stretched out, maybe four to six inches. And it's just filled with remnants of digestion. 
Uh, they go into the large intestine. And the last part of the digestion of these remnants of food is the bacteria. They uh, further digest the uh, sugars in the food. Uh, they digest sugars that the uh, small intestine can't digest. And they utilize these for energy. Uh, these uh, organisms interact with the bowel wall and uh, have a communication with the body's immune system, telling it what is outside threatening it and asking the immune system to make uh, antibacteria, anti-damage uh, material to counteract these, uh, whatever is in the environment, you know, to make antibodies against, uh, say, a virus or a bacteria. So uh, they do that. Uh, these uh, bacteria in the large intestine, they also make vitamins. They're a major producer of vitamins, including B12. And uh, so they perform that function. They reabsorb water or the intestine reabsorbs water. And uh, so this is a, an important organ of the body. If that large intestine, which is the last eight, eight feet of the intestine, that beginning at the cecum, which happens to be where the appendix is, if that eight feet is removed, say for colitis or injury or for some reason, it's removed and uh, the bowel empties through the abdomen now through an ileostomy, which is a, a tube in a bag. Uh, what happens is the body actually converts the first few feet, which would, would be the last few feet actually, of the small intestine into a large intestine. It becomes colonized, just like the large intestine is, to produce uh, this, these essential uh, reactions and syntheses uh, that would have been done in the large intestine if it was present. That's how important this organ is, and that's how important these bacteria are. They're crucial to survive. And the body will make a new large intestine, quote, large intestine, if uh, your old one is removed. So uh, <clears throat> these bacteria are uh, naturally growing in the intestine. There are four trillion bacteria per, four trillion per cc of stool. And there are over 500 different species of bacteria. There are also viruses and yeasts and parasites and other organisms that are there in a symbiotic relationship. Uh, they're there to uh, work together to enhance the health of the body through the mechanisms I just talked about and others. And uh, <clears throat> so you, you, uh, they naturally grow there. Now, uh, what determines what kind of bacteria grows? Well, what determines what grows? And we call them friendly and non-friendly or pathologic or helpful. Uh, what determines what grows, the kind of bacteria, is the food that you feed them. If you feed the, the body, the bacteria, by eating, if you feed it lots of sugar, oligosaccharides, lots of sugars, and these are uh, non-digestible sugars because they've got to make it through the small intestine, in other words, not be absorbed, and end up in the large intestine where the bacteria can, uh, can burn them. Uh, these um, oligosaccharides are uh, uh, are uh, uh, determined or do determine the oligosaccharides do determine what kind of bacteria grow. If you grow, if you consume uh, uh, sugars, then you grow predominantly good bacteria, which do good fermentation processes, which do not make carcinogens. Uh, which do not make foul gas smelling, small uh, smelling, foul smelling gas. And we'll talk about that next week. If you eat animal foods, uh, which have no sugar, I mean, milk has a little bit, but cheese, virtually none, chicken, beef, pork, fish, no, no sugar at all, then these bacteria have no sugar to eat. And uh, the kind of metabolism that they end up uh, uh, performing uh, results in the growth of uh, clostridia type bacteria. They're uh, gram positive bacteria, which do lots of unfavorable things. 
such as they make carcinogens. And uh, they also make the bad stink in your uh, ball gas, which again, we'll talk about next week. Uh, so you can control what kind of bacteria grow, mainly by what you feed them. Now, whether, another way you can control them is you can eat bacteria. You go to the health food store, or probably your local pharmacy, you could buy something called probiotics, probiotics. And these are bacteria that are uh, processed so that they will come alive again when they get into the intestine. And you can buy them. There are various manufacturers, various mixtures. But uh, when you eat them, they do provide <coughs> they do provide uh, bacteria that uh, make the intestine. Yeah, you try adding a new probiotic, maybe maybe a new one made of. Uh, fecal material from people from rural Africa, which I think is gonna be a new product out there. You could do that. Uh, the other thing that people do is uh, they take, actually buy the sugars, the ones that are in your food, the ones that are non-digestible oligosaccharides, and they uh, buy these sugars in capsules, these oligosaccharides, uh, fructo oligosaccharides, uh, uh, other oligosaccharides. So they buy these sugars and they take the sugars with the same idea of putting the right fuel in the large intestine so the good bacteria will grow. But why not just eat the right food? You know, it costs nothing. You're certain to get the best mixture of oligosaccharides and uh, safe and cheap and so on. So uh, if you think you have a, a bacterial problem, you must fix the source, which is the fuel for the bacteria. That's the right thing to do. Now, I just want to talk about one other situation when it comes to uh, to bacteria, and that has to do with cesarean sections. The uh, infant, the uterus, infant in the uterus, uh, the intestine is sterile, no bacteria at all in the infant uh, lying in the uterus prior to birth. And then what happens when the baby's born? Naturally, the baby passes through the birth canal, usually head first, usually face down. And what happens is the uh, infant, as it goes past the mother's uh, rectum and anus, uh, swallows a tremendous amount of mom's bacteria. And this is what's supposed to happen. This is normal, natural is to swallow mom's feces in the process of being born so that the, back, the, the bowel can be properly colonized. And uh, these days, of course, you can't count on that because the mother, in most cases, eats the rich American diet and her bowel bacteria is uh, horrible. But it's better than, I believe, another thing that happens, which is cesarean section. Uh, when you have a cesarean section, in other words, you take the baby out through the abdomen rather than the vagina and past the uh, the mother's anus. When you take it out uh, through the abdomen, you skip all bacterial contamination except beginning with the hospital operating room. And there the baby picks up uh, bacteria. Well, these operating rooms in some cases have... Uh, have uh, had their last surgery as a, a sepsis and a draining in of an abdomen of the infection. And uh, they've certainly been contaminated by many bacteria from many sources. So the baby is born into a, a dirty, uh, unhealthy environment. And as a result, uh, picks up the bacteria of the hospital as its intestinal bacteria. And then uh, to make matters worse, uh, what happens is uh, most mothers try to breastfeed. I think about 65% try, but uh, they only succeed for a few months. And those that don't even try, they go right to bottle feeding. The bottle feeding discourages the growth of healthy bacteria, uh, lactobacillus bacteria in the intestine, whereas breast milk encourages the growth of healthy bacteria. So you end up getting your baby born uh, with a a sickening internal environment. And uh, this is, of course, one in, one reason for increased risk of uh, infections, 
pneumococcal pneumonia is 60 times more common in bottle-fed babies than breastfed babies during the first three months of life. Let me repeat those numbers. 60 times greater in bottle-fed babies over the first three months of life of an infant. So these bacteria are very important. What do you do with a newborn baby? Well, maybe there's some kind of formula out there you can buy in the pharmacy or the hospital has that mimics mother's bacteria. Now, I haven't kept up with that, but I would certainly ask, you know, do you have some kind of uh, uh, probiotics to give my baby that would be natural if I'd have had a natural childbirth? Uh, an important question. So that that's about your bacteria. I would certainly uh, pay attention to them. I wouldn't look to eating uh, products made of, quote, excellent bacteria, probiotics to solve your problems, because it's not going to solve them permanently. You're not going to get healthy bacteria to grow on a, a diet of unhealthy food, meat, eggs, dairy, etc., You must, to get the bacteria to grow, give them the fuel that they need to thrive. And that's sugar, oligosaccharides, sugar. Sugars that aren't digested in the small intestine, but pass into the large intestine, where healthy bacteria thrive and produce uh, good results in terms of the immune system, bowel function, uh, autoimmune reactions. Uh, there are studies done actually where they use probiotics to treat rheumatoid arthritis with some very successful results. In that chapter, chapter 12, uh, there is a whole discussion about diseases and all kinds of references that uh, show benefits of taking probiotics on uh, particular diseases. And I put that in the book and it's very positive. Remember, I wrote that book 10 years ago. It's a very positive chapter. Not any direct recommendations, but when you read it, you'd say it's worth it. It uh, causes no harm. They're relatively inexpensive. It's worth a try. And uh, there is evidence that it really works with uh, uh, colitis and arthritis and uh, constipation and irritable bowel syndrome, et cetera. And I published those papers for you. But I have to tell you, you know, I've been paying very close attention to this for not just one decade, but probably three decades to the science and also, most importantly, to my clinical experience. Uh, I, I love to remind you that I've seen over 10,000 patients and I've taken care of over 6,000 in uh, uh, live-in situations where I knew exactly what they're eating and doing. And uh, I also get a, I had a chance to personally ask their history. You know, what have you taken? What's worked? How about, you know, they talked about probiotics and so on. And I have to say, I, I cannot recall anyone who gave me a dramatically positive story about adding probiotics or prebiotics to their diet and having uh, amazing outcomes. I, I just haven't heard it. I, I've looked for it. I've wanted to see it. You know, I'd like to be able to give you a pill too to additionally help you above what really will help you, which is the food. I'd like to be able to do that. In fact, I often joke <clears throat> that uh, the diet I teach works only if you take a pill I sell you too, which you must buy directly from me at uh, $10 a pill. And the pill is green and it has an M stamped on the side. Now the M could stand for McDougal, but it could also stand for money. The diet doesn't work without the pill. Boy, oh boy, I, let's see, I have uh, two big apartments on uh, uh, in Honolulu and Portland. I uh, have, oh yeah, I'd just be rolling in money. Might be paying Gustavo $300,000 a year. Hey, Gustavo, let's put, let's put out that pill called M. The diet doesn't work unless you take M. Huh. You and I be on the right that. track now. We we be on the right track. So, but uh, unfortunately, folks, I can't tell you that with a straight face. But uh, that's what you're being sold by the medical business and the health food care business. Is you're sold a solution that's not a solution. It may be of temporary benefit at best, of considerable cost and risk for sure, and. Uh, it's not going to solve the problem. No. 
It's like you don't stop a cigarette cough by taking cough syrups. You may cover it up a little bit, but you don't stop it. You got to stop the problem, which is the irritation from the, the smoke. And you don't stop falling down drunk unless you stop the half a bottle of vodka a day. You know, there's no, no uh, balance pill, Dramamine or anything else that's going to stop that. Same thing with food. You know, you're going to continue to be overweight, bad intestinal feelings, uh, arthritic. Uh, you know, as long as you continue to eat what fosters the problem. Now, will you always get cured 100%? No, you won't. I mean, the body's been seriously damaged. But you will uh, reap benefits, uh, if you're very honest with yourself, that are far greater than you should realistically expect. Because the body's an amazing healer. And you'll sit back and say, you know, and I get a letter, I get several letters a day where people tell me these stories. And I always love hearing them about uh, what uh, the advice Mary and I and the Brother, the other staff of the program have given about how much it's changed your life and helped you. And uh, you always say that uh, everything was positive. You know, your food bill, you don't have to see the doctor anymore. Don't take all the expensive drugs. Not only does your uh, arthritis feel better, but you haven't had irritable bowel syndrome or constipation or diarrhea or you know it's just uh, it, there's so many things that happen positively when you fix the cause and the cause of at least 80 percent of the troubles of the listeners of this show were or still are and at least 80 to 90 percent of your friends the problems of food and the solution is simple it's free it's easy to understand. You can do it uh, right now. It's just kind of up to you. You have to have your eyes open, and then you have to uh, just take that decision. Today I'm a smoker. Tomorrow I'm not. Today I'm a drunk. Tomorrow I'm not. Today I'm obese. Tomorrow I'm going to start changing that. You know, you just have to make that decision. Once you have your eyes open, you make the decision, then all the work's done. All the work's done. It just always happens. And you'll find out what is residual, what you did permanently damage. So I told you many times, uh, 52 years later, I still have a pretty severe limp after the stroke I had at age 18. It's not going to go away. I don't care how many chants, uh, how many uh, probiotics, how many best wishes you give me, I'm going to limp until I'm not walking. <laughs> anyway, so that's a problem. Well, I really want to say today, maybe we'll talk about bad gas and other gas things tomorrow, or maybe you're just tired of talking about the intestine. Uh, we can go on to another subject. So we certainly welcome, um, I, I know many of you have specific questions, things you really would like to talk about about your own health. And, you know, we'd like to talk to you about these things too. You, you can always drop me an email. I'll do the best I can to get back to you. And I probably answered 99.9% uh, .9 of emails. And some of you just write me uh, with nasty comments and I just don't feel I need to answer them. That happens rarely, maybe once a month. And uh, some of you, uh, I don't uh, see your comments because they get lost on the internet. But otherwise, I pretty much answer any reasonable questions. Please make them short. Uh, some of you, I uh, have to spend 15 minutes to get to your question. And uh, I get about 100 emails a day. So, you know, try, try, try and make short, specific. And if it's of a general discussion, send it to Gustavo at webinar at drmcdougall.com. And we'll answer it uh, for the general public. And then I can spend more time like I do now I can spend more time on it, and uh, lots of other people will benefit. So, Gustavo, we are now uh, for 35 minutes into it. Usually the time we stop and see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, yeah we do have questions. And um, Dr. Madugal, can you clarify when you were talking about uh, how bacteria feeds and sugar, can you specify that whether the, where the sugar comes from, whether it's from starch or is it table sugar? Because people get confused when you say the word sugar. Yeah, I know they do. Uh, when I say sugar, I'm talking about uh, all kinds of sugars, uh, 
short chains of sugar or single sugars like glucose or uh, short chains like lactose or uh, they're longer chain sugars and then they're really long chain sugars and those would be starches uh, which would be uh, uh, anyway they're, they're long chain sugars these are the oligosaccharides which are uh, fructooligosaccharide and <clears throat> and uh, these these sugars come from potatoes, rice, sweet potatoes, corn, beans. Beans are a <clears throat> very high source of uh, these sugars. In fact, beans, uh, particularly red beans, uh, are notorious for giving people some pretty serious stomach cramps and gas. And uh, some people classify that as toxicity. And uh, I guess with the pain and the, and bloating that they suffer, you could clearly call that toxicity. Fortunately, it's not fatal or of major consequence, but it, it does hurt when you eat red beans. And, uh, you know, they're, they're notorious for that, yeah. uh, the, especially raw. Uh, cooking, uh, there's actually a study I have. Uh, you can look it up on the internet. I will uh, show it to you and I'll probably put it in next month's newsletter. And you can uh, look it up uh, probably on Google. It's uh, I got it open access. The effect of cooking and uh, the effect of cooking and soaking on oligosaccharides and lectins in red kidney beans. Uh, by the way, I'm going to talk about lectins, which are uh, proteins that attach to sugars, which are a great topic of, uh, of uh, diet discussion these days. There are people who claim that uh, lectins are the reason for essentially all sicknesses. And these would be the uh, uh, the parts of plants. They're parts of plants. Well, they perform and you find them in all kinds of foods, but they're particularly high in grains and beans, lectins are. So we're going to talk a little bit about those uh, next week because they're becoming a very popular diet controversy. Okay. Uh, just, just like uh, the grain brain and right. uh, wheat belly. And they're just... Uh, today's diet of the day. Uh, well, anyway, this article says uh, the effect of soaking and cooking on oligosaccharides, those are the sugars. These are long chains of amylose and amylopectin, sugars, starches, long chains of sugars that are uh, relatively non-digestible. Uh, the effect of cooking on uh, lectins and red beans and uh, what they did is they first soaked them for 12 hours. Soaking uh, causes a tremendous amount of gain in water in beans and in grains. And soaking begins digestion of these non-digestible uh, sugars, chains of sugars. And uh, this particular study done, which again, I think you can get open access, uh, uh, say through a search engine like Google, uh, they soaked them for 12 hours first, and then they cooked them at 80 degrees centigrade. And the result was that uh, <clears throat> lectin activity uh, was significantly reduced at 12 hours of soaking by a 48% drop. And uh, 12 hours of soaking resulted in an 80% reduction in raffinose, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, oligosaccharides, the gas-producing oligosaccharides. So 80% uh, reduction in these uh, troublesome, relatively non-digestible oligosaccharides and uh, about a 80% reduction in lectins. Oh, excuse me, not 80%, 48% uh, reduction in lectins, an 80% of, uh, uh, weight gain in water in this particular study. So... Um, <clears throat> Anyway, the way you deal with these uh, non-digestible sugars is you, well, let's talk about that next week. We'll talk about okay. ways of uh, reducing sugar and reducing uh, farts. And that would be my August August uh, 2002 newsletter called Bad Farts. <laughs> Thanks. We see, all yeah, right. I'm looking at get read ahead, read ahead of time. And it's also in, I think, probably chapter 13 of the, uh, right. of the Digestive Tune-Up book. There's discussion there. And we'll, we'll touch on that. All right. Very good. That's my tool. There's someone here, a viewer, that says that her youngest daughter was born by C-section and has frequent issues with her bowels. She even had 
part of her colon removed at age 15. And she says, what can I do besides the starch-based diet to help improve her bowel bacteria? Are probiotic, probiotics a good option for her? Okay, well, see, my, I told you there is evidence if you go to that chapter, chapter 12, mm -hmm. you look at the reference section in the back, you'll find uh, papers, scientific papers published that say yes. But my experience has been, I really haven't seen much help, uh, uh, nothing that, that I, is memorable in terms of taking bacteria in those situations. However, you know, I, I've just seen a, a few people uh, who have tried pro probiotics, maybe four or 500. Uh, so I can't give you, I, 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 I can't give you a definitive answer and I can't, certainly can't discourage you because the costs are so insignificant and the side effects are virtually none that I think it's worth a try. But <clears throat> uh, breast uh, bottle feeding is certainly related to the development of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease as an older person, adolescent or adult. There's uh, clearly evidence that bottle fed babies as uh, adolescents and adults have a much, much greater risk of developing these two autoimmune diseases, which can be fatal and debilitating and result in the removal of a colon, et cetera. No question about it. <clears throat> but your daughter, as I mentioned, now has a new colon. Her small intestine has uh, colonized with bacteria so that it looks like the large intestine. Well, you, you wanna protect that too, and you wanna have the right bacteria grow there. So I would, uh, I would do what I generally recommend for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And we have many case examples on the website under the Star McDougallers of people with uh, both of these conditions of inflammatory bowel disease and how they have been cured, uh, cured of uh, their disease with dietary change. There are also scientific articles that support that particular statement that you can find on the internet. So a dietary change is it. And uh, you want to approach it as an autoimmune disease. So with autoimmune diseases, I generally start out with a uh, starch-based diet without uh, gluten-containing products, uh, those that are related to celiac disease. We've talked about that. So in other words, no wheat, barley, and rye. And I also don't start with soy products. Soy products are, are uh, terribly disturbing to the gut when consumed in significant amounts for most people. If you're a healthy person, you eat a lot, a whole lot of tofu, you know, if it becomes a dominant part of the meal. It's not surprising for me to hear and see uh, people developing cramps and uh, change in the uh, consistency of their stool. So uh, I don't think soy is a, a good starter pro product for the bowels, uh, even fermented soy for the bacteria. Uh, so I, I leave out all soy products. The other thing is, when you tell people they can eat soy, all of a sudden, soy hot dogs and Boca burgers and soy turkey and soy cheese and soy everything that looked like the original everything becomes acceptable. And that's a, a real serious mistake because these uh, soy cheeses are 90% fat and fat's going to cause you intestinal problems, especially if you have bowel problems. And uh, <clears throat> these uh, soy hot dogs and soy burgers are about 70% isolated soy protein. In other words, you know, they, in the making, they start with a, you know, a handful of just protein. No fat, no vitamins, no minerals, no fiber, just isolated soy protein that they make by cooking and grinding soybeans and then washing them with alcohol and water and alkaline and acid solutions. So they've got this... Uh, isolated substance and they start adding other things to it like wheat protein and sometimes dairy and eggs and uh, you know other oils and other products to it and then they <clears throat> treat it with high pressure machinery like that used in uh, building manufacturing making fiberboard so with heat and pressure they turn this concoction of substances that are in isolated soy foods into something that looked like the original. It's just a concoction of uh, chemicals and they're not healthy. So that's why I start out telling people, just stay away from all the soy so you don't make a mistake. Um, 
So it's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, uh, gluten-free, for your wheat, barley, and rye to start out with. And then as a, a last effort, you'd go on to something like the elimination diet, which is a very, very simple diet. That's described in my May 2014 newsletter under uh, case studies, 10 case studies of severe, uh, really severe rheumatoid and other kinds of arthritis that were cured with a change in diet, I recommend. And that's 10. I, I could provide for you 50. You know, we, we have uh, so many testimonies uh, every week of people who say, you know, how sick they were, how disabled they were, and how they changed their diet. They didn't believe it. But uh, four to seven days later, they felt better. And here they are four months later or one year later, and they're uh, completely cured, maybe a little residual here and there. Now, some people have some very deformed uh, joints, and those aren't going to straighten out with uh, with consuming uh, rice and beans and potatoes. Uh, they're not going to straighten out. These are permanently damaged. So uh, that's what I would encourage you to think about in terms of your daughter and her bowels. What do you got to lose? Cost you nothing. Right. No risks. You know, and uh, she's, uh, I assume, 15 now or maybe old, you know, probably older now. But she's got a whole life ahead of her. And even if it didn't... Uh, dramatically improve, and I know it will, her bowel problems, but reduce her risk of breast cancer and, and uh, arthritis, inflammatory arthritis and type 2 diabetes and obesity, <laughs> the, the all too common epidemic, 38% of people in the U.S. and other developed countries, pretty close, mm -hmm. overweight 80% of people. So why not give her a tool that can't hurt and can only help? because uh, she'll suffer without having her cheeseburger. Well, excuse me, uh, her cheeseburger is what got her in trouble. And uh, th these diseases, these uh, inflammatory bowel diseases are only present in Western countries. Now, they didn't once exist in China or Japan or Thailand or right. rural, uh, rural Africa or uh, rural Central America. They, they, they didn't exist. There was no such thing. And then the Western diet came to each and every one of these nations. And all of a sudden they had the American epidemic. What a coincidence. Genes changed in three decades. What a coincidence. Bad luck and the wrath of God finally got after China or India. You know, I mean, how naive can people be? Yeah. Uh, Dr. McDougall, when you were talking about the um, tofu product like really processed uh, products uh, you were not talking just about plain tofu like the ones that they use to make uh, the burgers when in the 10-day program well, you know not for healthy people okay you know we're talking about people just getting started um if you are uh, we, we serve tofu we serve probably a little bit of tofu every day at the clinic Yes. We also clearly identify that the, this has tofu in it, mm -hmm. and it's uh, always served as a condiment. So, right. no, uh, I, it's, uh, tofu, tofu is not an unhealthy food. It's just a rich food, and uh, that's in its natural, traditional form that people have been serving for at least 5,000 years, such as soy milk and uh, uh, tofu and uh, tempeh and you know, other traditional soy, soy food products, they've been a, a, a part of um, <clears throat> diets, particularly Asian diets, mm -hmm. for at least 5,000 years. But this is a whole new world of tofu. Right. You know, tofu has become a, 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 a multi, multi-billion dollar part of the mm -hmm. food business. And they're just like every other business, even though their products make people sick, like isolated soy protein increases the risk of bone loss, uh, it has uh, right. uh, many side effects. It's probably the kind so, of the, the quantity, would, would you say? that? I mean, uh, Well, quantity is everything, right. Gustavo. Uh, you could smoke a cigarette a week and still be a worldwide excellent concert player. Because <laughs> 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 you smoke uh, two packs a week, and pretty soon you might be too short of breath to play the keys. 
you know, I, everything's dose. Uh, the body will take a little arsenic. It'll take a little of this and that. And sometimes a little bit of a poisonous thing mm -hmm. uh, can have some benefits, but uh, something becomes a poison in terms of concentration and quantity for sure. Right. Yeah. And uh, the thing about tofu is that it's so familiar with people uh, now changing from an animal food garbage-based diet mm -hmm. to something a little bit healthier. <laughs> and when I say little, I really mean a little bit. A healthier. little, yeah. By switching to uh, soy pizza, this grease, <laughs> grease, <a> grease <laughs> that's going down your chin with your soy pizza and uh, soy hot dogs that are 70% isolated protein and probably oh. contribute nothing to a bowel movement. No. Or certainly very little. Um, Anyway, I, I, uh, uh, unless you're confident, as I am with most people, that they'll tolerate a, uh, a delicacy portion of tofu products, oh, well, I think yes. you should stay away from it in the beginning. Right. I think you should always tend towards simplicity. Uh, if you're thinking, well, let's see, should I eat 100 different foods or just potatoes? Just potatoes. That's you know, right. Because that's always right. Or just sweet potatoes. That's all. Just eat sweet potatoes and water. Or just brown rice and a little fruit or, or uh, vegetable for the vitamin A and C. Grains and legumes need a little, a little extra vitamin A and C. So they have, you have to eat a little bit of fruit and perishable vegetable, like an orange right. slice or a broccoli flowerette. And uh, th that kind of thinking, simple thinking... When you're desperate, like having a daughter with uh, those kinds of uh, intestinal problems and suffering, horrible suffering for a person to go through, particularly a young person. When you compare going through that kind of suffering even once mm -hmm. or one day and uh, living on sweet potatoes and broccoli and you know a little bit of uh, yeah. tolerable seasoning, uh, particularly tolerable would, would be a little salt, a little sugar on the surface of the food and uh, you, you compare those two. I, I can't imagine a person or a close family member coming to any other conclusion, but oh, what would you guess? <laughs> You're talking about my daughter's life. You're talking about you know, my financial future. You know, what, 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 what it's costing to take care of her has bankrupted us. It's, it's uh, taken away our home. Uh, caused us to borrow from friends and yeah. And uh, and her personal suffering and interference with her social interaction and her learning and future and familyhood and so on is just yeah. not even comparable. I, 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 until you have that perspective, and unfortunately that happens when people get into trouble. That's right. It, it's, it's almost impossible to fairly balance. Let's see. Whether, whether they have a heart attack or this uh, tri-tip steak. Well, that steak looks pretty good. Not only feel any chest pain. <laughs> yeah. Well, once the chest pain hits and the surgeon shows you the scalpel, you'll go, mm. you know what? That tri-tip wasn't really that good looking. That wasn't that I could have skipped that pepperoni pizza. Yeah, we're all that way. You know, uh, after the consequence, we look back and we go, why didn't I? I saw it. I knew it. Why did I uh, deny it? Why didn't I? That's because of human nature. We just... We like what we like, and we want to continue to do what we like. And, you know, people love to hear good news about their have bad habits. And, my goodness, don't put me in that kind of confrontation. I just want to be healthy and do what I want. Exactly. Well, fine. So, <laughs> but it didn't work out that way for me, and maybe it will for you and your uh, husband and wife and your children. But I doubt it because I never see it. Right. I, I remember I'm a doctor. I take care of people and their families. And I never have somebody come in to me and say, yeah, you know, my, they'll come in and say, well, husband and wife are healthy and we change our diet and our whole family eats well and all the kids are, you know, top soccer players and life is great. And But I, I, I never, I can never remember, and I know it's true, that uh, there was a person who said, came in and said, you know, my mom and dad were in perfect health. All of my brothers and sisters are in wonderful shape. Uh, all my immediate family is doing wonderful. I've never had that happen. Almost always I hear people say, I, I changed my diet. 
look at me, I've lost uh, 70 pounds, got off, you know, XYZ medication. I'm in phenomenal shape, but I keep trying to help my brother and my sister and my mom and dad or my children, and they just won't listen to me. You feel like a lone ranger. You feel like an alien. Yeah. You, but I see it, and I see they're dying, and they just won't respond. Well, that's human nature. They don't want to respond. Uh, they want to be thin. They want to have a good bomb moment. They want to feel well. They want to live long. They want to be able to work hard. But they don't want to fix the problem. No. And uh, just like when I used to smoke two packs of marbles a day. Hey, I really loved the first cigarette. <laughs> and the second one wasn't bad. Uh, but the rest of them, the, the other uh, 39 were uh, difficult to get down, but I had no choice. I didn't want to quit. And uh, I know a lot of you are that way about many things. Uh, burdensome spouses, uh, uh, food, alcohol, <laughs> heroin, all kinds of things. You, you, you'd like it different, but uh, it, it's too hard to face the change. Unfortunately, uh, with time, fortunately with time, people realize that. And unfortunately, until they do, they stay sick. But once they do, we always look back. I'm sure every one of you can repeat the same thing. We always look back and say, why didn't we do this earlier? Mm -hmm. This is so, so positive. And I wrote this book so easy and so improved my life. That's human nature, too. But there's a period of suffering you go through. And that suffering may be two or three days, it could be two or three weeks, and maybe two or three months, it could be years. You know, a long time you have to, I, it's been since October 20th, 1972, since I had my last cigarette. But when I get around cigarette smokers, mm. I, oh, <laughs> I, I, I remember how good that was, was that 45 years ago? And boy, I, I, it, it's not that I don't ever think and it's not strong thoughts, so don't worry about it. Boy, it sure be nice to have a, yeah. a cigarette again. There were so many good feelings from that first one, but the rest was just a, a horrible yeah. coughing, choking pain. Not worth it. <laughs> but it's human behavior. It's, it's all of us. It is. There, there are uh, no exceptions that I know. Some people are more moderate than others. So it might be easier for them. But even my mother, who is the most moderate person in the world, was. She mm -hmm. unfortunately just died last month, a month at 93. Uh, she, 93 she died. But she smoked cigarettes until she was like 86. And we could uh, never get her, most moderate person in the world. You know, she'd had maybe this much wine. No, I didn't, she didn't. Her, her grandmother did. But, but maybe this much, she, at most this much wine once a year. And uh, or any alcohol, and she always kept active. I got plenty of sunshine. Uh, she was a coffee drinker, but her main outstanding issue, as far as her two sons, which are physicians, and son-in-law, who's a physician, and daughter, who's a registered nurse, are <clears throat> obvious uh, concern and uh, misunderstanding was. She was a tobacco addict. They took an x-ray of her maybe when she was 84, and they showed her the x-ray, and they said, look at this. I mean, you've got such severe emphysema, we can hardly believe you can breathe. But she wouldn't quit, and she finally did, uh, I think about six years before she died. And she lived good. She uh, didn't uh, die of symptoms of emphysema. Uh, she wasn't short of breath at all. Uh, it's amazing what the body would survive. What it is amazing. And even and my point is that even nice people like my mother, not radical people like me, even nice, reasonable, sensible, uh, go by the rule book people like my mom. She got hooked on cigarettes when she was about 24. I think she was in the Navy at 24, just before she married my dad. And uh, that was her thing. That was her thing, man. Cigarettes were her thing. Her thing. So we're, we all should be on guard. Well, thank you, Dr. McDougall. I think we're, we're going to close this webinar.
Oh, good. That was, I mean, it was good, good fun. Thanks for letting me talk so much. Yes. Well, we just love to hear you. Everything you say is interesting and important. So I appreciate it. Well, let, let, Everybody let, me, let, me, let, let, let me leave with our program update. Our June, uh, maybe second, third or fourth program begins uh, just a week from tomorrow is uh, full. Uh, so it's closed, but there is a waiting list and sometimes people cancel the last week. Uh, our um, August program still has just a couple of spots in it. And then the next program after that that's open to the public, I believe, is December. There may be one September, but I believe it's December because we run programs for businesses, uh, for companies uh, like CenturyLink and Whole Foods for their employees. So uh, think about August if you'd like to get in, uh, because I know that'll be closed uh, very, very shortly. And uh, then consider December. And uh, we also have a, a September uh, intensive weekend, which was so popular last time. Uh, we, we set up another date for September, which is a, just a weekend, the most inexpensive uh, personal contact we'll, you'll have with the, uh, with the speakers of the McDougall program, Dr. Lyle, Jeff Novick, uh, Anthony Lim, myself, Mary, et cetera. That will be in September. And uh, do get signed up for that because that one sold out too, the one that we just had a couple of weeks ago. And they're lots of fun. But that's, those are our programs coming up. And we want to meet you. We want to see you. We want to interact with you. We want to give you some big jump starts along the way. And there are many out there that just plain and simple can't do it without us. And the reason you can't is you can't get a doctor to cooperate. And you're afraid to do the kind of changes we're asking on your own. I understand. Stop uh, you know, 20 years of blood pressure pills or 15 years of uh, insulin if you're a type 2 diabetic or uh, type 2 diabetic pills, essentially always we stop. I mean, for you to do that at home on your own, I, I can imagine it's overwhelming. But we do provide uh, this program, which is uh, uh, extremely well run because it's run by very dedicated people who really love doing the program. Uh, anybody that comes in contact with us, I know, because I've never heard otherwise, you tell the boss. Uh, I know they know just how much the staff cares and uh, how important it is, it is for, us, for us to help you and how little much of the business aspect of the program comes out. Uh, yeah, you have to write the check when you come, but uh, the program is not just focused on financial issues. It's focused on getting you well. Uh, and we're there. Uh, we're there personally and very active. And we'd love to have a chance to see you sometime this year. So look at <clears throat> look at the website, look at the programs, look at the opportunities, and do get signed up because uh, fortunately, we're uh, very popular and becoming more popular yes. by the day. And 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 just one last thing: if you do know co know companies, businesses, IBM, Apple, Ford Motor, General Motors, uh, your whatever one thousand dollar or one thousand employee member uh, company or whatever that uh, wants to increase their profits tremendously, tremendously. As I mentioned to uh, CenturyLink, the 120 people that they sent for us to educate for 10 days, almost 10 days, the 120 people they sent to educate cost them in total less than a cost for one heart bypass surgery gone bad and two gone good. <laughs> right. Yeah, two gone well. Uh, that's how inexpensive it's it is. So, yeah. From, from a business point of view, I mean, if you're the person who writes the checks for your company, then you ought to start thinking about easy ways to save money and increase your productivity of your company by having healthier employees. And we're here right now and very interested in building that part of the business uh, is to work with companies because we do so much obvious good that's so easy for them to see by just looking at their books. And that's why they keep coming back. Yeah. But anyway, that's up. That's it for now. I All right. enjoy talking to you. Very good. Well, we hope you to know, see you next week. Well, it's my plan to be here next week.
Just all right. You have a good weekend. All of you have a good weekend. Uh, spend time on the discussion board and yes. the newsletter will come out in, uh, let's see. Either Wednesday or Thursday. I think, I think probably Wednesday or Thursday. So next, yeah. next time we talk about lectins. All you know, right. Like the new diet craze about avoiding the usual stuff, you know, avoid yeah. starches and so on. And eat all the meat you can stuff in your face. <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll, try, I'll get that newsletter done by the middle of the next week, and uh, let's let's keep together, work together, and spread the good news. You all know, right, you can always help other people, and it's really fun. So thank you. Thank you for helping us. Bye bye. Okay. Goodbye, everybody.